As you know, today's topic is uh, a very fundamental, uh, essential topic uh, that is dear and near to all of our hearts, uh, inshallah, and it is none other than the uh, topic of the prayer of the Salah. Now the first thing I want all of us to think about is when we think of the Salah, what kind of thoughts first conjure up in our um, minds and our hearts? Is it something that uh, is a burdensome duty, a heavy obligation or task that we have to fulfill and just can't wait to get over with uh, so that we can move on? Or is it something that we look forward to? Something that relaxes us and de-stresses us uh, is a break from all the um, daily chaos of life. And even before we ask these questions, we have to ask an even more basic one, and that is, do we pray at all in the first place? Are we praying? If so, are we praying on time? So the first thing that I want to talk about today, inshallah, is about when we become lax in our prayer or abandon the prayer to some extent. What is the big deal after all about not praying? We need to understand, inshallah, the importance of the salah through uh, understanding what happens when you don't make the salah. Now the first uh, hadith we're going to start with is uh, the words of the Messenger وسلم, He told us what the big deal is about Salah when he said the first thing that we're going to be asked about on the Day of Judgment is the Salah. This is the very first thing. And I'll read the hadith to you. The first thing that the servant will be questioned about on the Day of Judgment is it his or her Salah. If it was sound, indeed he would have succeeded and salvaged. And if that was spoiled, indeed he would have been lost and doomed. Then if his obligatory salahs were lacking, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, yani, to the angels, look at the voluntary deeds of my servant, yani, the voluntary salahs, the extra prayers, so that they would make up the missing prayers that were from the fara'id, from the obligatory deeds. Then all of his actions would be according to this. So here you see uh, in your mind's eye the scene that's going to be conjured up before all of us on the day of judgment. When we are standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you know the meeting with Allah will be a direct one. There will be no intermediary between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet has uh, told us, which means that then you will surely stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and there will be no barrier, no hijab, no curtain between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and there will be no one interpreting for you, no one translating uh, for you. So the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment is a private one. It's where you are directly standing before him. And imagine you're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the first thing he asks you is about your salah. This is the first question that you are faced with. And depending on um, the, the quality and the state of your salah, will be the, depending on that, will be the fate of the other actions. Yani the salah directly affects our other actions. Only after the salah is taken uh, to account for, then only will the other actions be looked at. Now imagine not having an answer at that point. Allah is asking here in this private meeting about the state of your prayer and you don't have an answer. The salah search is conducted, as we saw from the hadith, meticulously through that uh, record, that accurate record that the angels uh, keep. And all that they find, only message that beams uh, forth after that search is deleted. There's no salah, or it's incomplete. Now if we have deleted salah from the daily schedule of our lives, how can it show up when we will most need it to on the Day of Judgment? Now at that point, a person would do anything to go back into time and to correct uh, her behavior. They would give up everything, they would ransom the whole world uh, including their closest uh, relatives, just to be given a chance to go back into the world and to not have to face what will then be before them. Just like the person uh, in Surah Al-Zumr, in verse 58, the person that says, This is the person who will say on the Day of Judgment when he or she will see the punishment, that I wish there was a chance for me an opportunity for me, some way that I could go back and I would be become, uh, become among the muhsineen. Now he didn't say notice, this person didn't say that I would become among the muslimin, among the muslims, or among the mu'mineen, among the believers. Rather, the choice of words that he used, that if I were given a chance I would go back and become of the muhsineen. These are the highest level of worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
they are beyond the Muslims, they are beyond the Mu'mini, beyond the believers. This is the highest state of worship that a person can attain, that is of ihsan, to worship Allah as if you see Him. And if you are not able to do that, then at least to know that He sees you. So this will be the uh, state of the person on the Day of Judgment, uh, out of regret. And having that determination at that time to be among the those who are foremost in the good deeds, but of course, it will be to no avail. And this is why actually the Day of Judgment is called Yawm al-Hasra. Yawm al-Hasra is the day of regret. So that's why for many people, uh, for all of uh, humanity, to some extent, everyone is going to have some level of regret on that day. Now, Yawm al is called Yawm al-Hasra, but what is today? What is today called that both you and I have? Today is that Karra that is mentioned in the Surah. In Surah Al-Zumar, in this verse, law, anna li karra. karra is a chance, an opportunity. What is today? Today is that chance. We are not on the day of judgment yet. We're not standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yet. We have that chance today. That chance that that Quranic figure is lamenting over in the ayah we just mentioned. And also, then understand the relationship between Salah and the rest of your actions. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... Um, there is a direct connection between the two. We know from another hadith, which is very similar to the first one, which says, أول ما يحاسب بالعبد يوم القيامة الصلاة The first thing, the narration starts off with the same part as the last, last one, that the first thing that a person will be taken to account for on the day of judgment is his salah. But then look at the rest of the narration. It says, فَإِذَا صُلَحَتْ صُلَحَ سَائِرُ عَمَلُ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ سَائِرُ عَمَلُ Which means that if it was sound, then the rest of his action will be sound. And if, if that was spoiled, then the rest of his action will also be spoiled. So you see there is a relationship, direct relationship between our salah and the rest of our actions. What does this really imply? Yani, if one is not fulfilling completely the, uh, recommend, the, the obligatory salawat, this throws all of the rest of their deeds into question about whether they're going to be accepted uh, or not. And notice that the hadith is talking about the one who is lacking in her prayer. It's not talking about the one who has abandoned the prayer altogether. This is just someone who is lacking in her prayer. Imagine the case of the one who has abandoned it altogether. What would their state be? Now, in order to kind of uh, step back to understand the importance of the salah, and we really can't appreciate how important it is, uh, unless we look at how it was legislated. What was the process? through which the salah was made for, was made obligatory. What happened? You know that whenever a uh, command uh, was sent down, it was through the process of wahi revelation from above uh, to the message of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on earth. However, for the uh, purpose of salah, for the uh, obligation of salah, the messenger himself was called up. The wahi did not come down, rather it was so important and significant that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was called up for the night journey, the ma'araj, right? And it's really important to um, go through the details of this journey to really appreciate the uh, enormity of the prayer. And just like, remember, on the day of judgment, the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be a direct one, so was this uh, salah, this fard that is upon all of us. This was also mandated through a direct meeting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly called the Prophet وسلم, up to the heavens in order to give the command for the prayer. And this was not the case with any other command. Everything else was sent down. Now, here we want to talk a little bit about the details of the Ma'raj, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. We're going to go into just a little bit of detail to give you an idea of what a grand journey this was. Because the purpose behind it was grand. In order to understand that, um, how did it begin, this splendid night journey? Of course, it starts in Mecca, right? The Prophet ﷺ is taken to uh, Medina. And after that, he travels to uh, Bethlehem. Uh, it comes in uh, some of the narrations. That he, and every place that he is being taken to uh, on the special uh, uh, ride, special mount that was prepared for him, he is told to get off and pray. So when he goes from Mecca to Medina, he is told to get off and pray. He goes to Bethlehem, he is told to dismount and pray. He goes to Beit al-Maqdis, Jerusalem. And uh, there, all of the Prophets had already assembled, waiting for Jibreel to bring the Prophet وسلم, to lead them in the prayer. And so every point of his journey, he is stopping, dismounting, and uh, praying. And then the ascension starts from the first heaven to the seventh heaven. And the first heaven we see, uh, the Prophet وسلم, sees Adam a.s. Then he goes through all of the heavens, uh, and in each are different prophets. And he sees all of them. And they all greet him and are happy by his coming. Until he finally gets to the seventh heaven, and that is where Ibrahim a.s. is. 
And then finally, and also uh, in the journey, he sees Bayt al-Ma'mur.